Well, good Wednesday evening, Harvest Baptist Church. It is so great to be back with you. I pray that you are well and surviving all the mess that we are uh, going through day by day. It is just, uh, we're in this together, as we have said, for many months, and I'm glad that we can have a chance to come face-to-face, so to speak, uh, by way of streaming on the Internet for our regular Harvest Baptist Church Wednesday evening prayer time and Bible study. And I'm going to get right into the prayer request. I have them, uh, because my memory is so short, I have I have them written down here uh, so that I will be able to, to, to share them to you, with you. Uh, Zella Parker, uh, Zella has pneumonia, some breathing issues. Please remember her in your prayers. You know, not long ago, we helped her uh, mourn the passing of Al. So remember Zella as you go to your places of prayer. Uh, Mary Bean, also one of our faithful, she and Zella, been in Harvest Baptist Church for many, many decades. And so pray for Mary, who has not been uh, doing well. The same goes for Don Adams. Don was in and out of the hospital uh, this week. Some heart rate issues. Uh, Pray for Don as he continues to recover. And then Steve Adelette, Steve and Jamie, a longtime members of our fam- church family. Uh, Steve's mother went to be with the Lord this week. Pray for his family as they grieve the passing of his mother. And then uh, there, there are a couple of other requests uh, that we have mentioned b- before but continue to need our prayers. Uh, Eddie Underwood was in and out of the hospital uh, with diverticulitis. I say he was in and out. He stayed in for a number of days. Eddie was in really, really serious condition for a while. He is at home recovering, as is Gene Long, who also spent an extensive period of time in the hospital uh, a couple of weeks ago. So continue to remember them. And then James Smith, James and Robin of our church family. James had surgery this morning. He was in and out of the hospital. He is at home recovering. And then we don't want to forget, in addition to the, the, the ones that I mentioned, others come to my mind, uh, Ann Hogan, who continues to uh, do rehab from having part of her leg amputated. Pray for, for Ann. And then there are many, many others that stand in the need of our prayers that are part of our church family. And we need to pray one for another, love one another, encourage one another. And if uh, these that I've mentioned or others that you know about, that, that are struggling, that, that have health issues or other issues, just call them. Give them a word of encouragement. Let them know that you love them and you're praying for them. That's what family members do. That's what friends do. That's what Christians do for each other. So I hope you'll take an opportunity to check on folks, check on your neighbors, check on your friends, check on our church members during this time that we're going through. And let's trust God to, to use this to bring us together and and to share Christ with other people. This is a wonderful opportunity. If you'll pray and look for opportunities to share Jesus Christ with the world, this is a wonderful time. I hope you'll do that. But let's go to the Lord in prayer. Pray for our church family. Pray for our services. We had uh, the food pantry today. Uh, The faithful volunteers turned out, and and as they have, we served over 100 families. We served over 100 families, and when you multiply three to four people per family, uh, we served three to 400 people this morning through our little food pantry over here. And thanks to your generosity, thanks to our volunteers, thanks to Harvest Baptist Church, our missionaries around the world tonight, and I don't want to spend uh, a lot of time uh, on minutia of prayer requests, but uh, we have been in contact by email and phone of many of our missionaries that literally serve around the world. And they also are struggling with this uh, coronavirus pandemic. So we want to pray for them and let them know that we love and pray for them and are encouraging them. Then our service is this coming Lord's Day, 9 o'clock and 1030. And please remember that. Uh, we we meet right here. I'm in the auditorium right now uh, on Wednesday afternoon at Harvest Baptist Church, and we we have a number of folks who come. Um, m- most all of them wear their mask. Some, when they're seated, we have social distance seating, and they take their mask off during the service, put them on when they leave. But also, 
at the nine o'clock service. We have uh, preschool and nursery. Uh, that's for n newborns up through four year olds. And at the nine o'clock service, we also have the big show. That's for K-5, five-year-olds through fifth graders. And it's all over in the children's building. And when you show up on Sunday morning, you come a little bit early, they'll check you in over there. We do take the temperature of uh, the children and our, our leaders that are over there working with our kids. We do take their temperatures. And so as you check them in, that'll be a part of the process. But you leave them there, come over here. We have wonderful music, a message from God's Word. And then when you, you leave, you go pick them up and head home. It's all uh, very well organized. Our ushers and our greeters are here with masks on, ready to help you. And I hope that if you're able and you're willing and you feel comfortable, that you'll show up Sunday morning, 9 o'clock. And then we also have another service at 1030 so that we have plenty of room to social distance. And at 1030, we also have nursery and preschool up through four-year-olds. But at 1030 right now, we do not have a children's church, but we are planning to start that in the very near future at that hour. So please remember that. Show up Sunday morning. And if not, certainly watch us online. We have our website, our Facebook page, and our YouTube channel. And uh, we share with them. We have uh, literally thousands of people who, who watch our services. Uh, I saw last week we had over 2,000 views of one of the services, and, and I'm so excited about that, that opportunity. And whether they watch for a little while or watch the whole thing, we are excited just to have the opportunity through that wonderful technology. So whether you watch online or whether you come in person, Harvest Baptist Church gathers and worships together Sunday morning, 9 o'clock and 1030, and pray for those services. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Remember these requests. And then we're going to get into the Word of God tonight. We're going to be in Revelation chapter 12. Revelation chapter 12, if you want to get your Bible or your uh whatever your phone, whatever you use for your Bible, Revelation chapter 12. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you for Jesus who loved us and gave himself for us. We come back to you tonight on this Wednesday evening, and we are privileged and thankful to be able to, to go out over the Internet uh, through live streaming, that people can sit in their homes or sit in a restaurant or wherever they happen to be, and watch us and participate with us. And thank you for that technology. And then, Lord, again, on Sunday morning, we'll use the very same technology to reach out to our people. Harvest Baptist Church gathers, whether it's online or in person. I pray you'd bless our effort. Thank you for our food pantry. Thank you for our missions. Thank you for our staff, our children's ministry, our youth ministry that we have been just moving on and, and ministering in every way we know. And just thank you for the privilege and the opportunity. These requests that have been mentioned, Father, we, we called out many names. And Father, no doubt there are other names that I didn't mention because I just I wasn't aware of their need or my memory is short. But Father, you know who they are and where they are. And that is the wonderful thing about you. And so we ask on behalf of the Harvest Baptist Church family, wherever they are, whatever need they might have, Lord Jesus, may you send the Holy Spirit, ministering angels, whatever you choose to do. Go where we can't go and do what we can't do and minister to the needs of your people. Touch their body, raise them up. Uh, those who, Father, need medical treatment, I pray that you would help the treatments to be effective, that you are the great physician. Use all those resources and Put your healing hand on us, and we will give you the praise, the honor, and the glory. Bless Harvest Baptist Church members wherever they are. Bless our offerings. Bless our ministries. Bless our volunteers. May what we do count just not for time, but for eternity, for eternal values and eternal souls. We ask it in Jesus' name, and for Jesus' sake we pray. Amen and amen. All right, we're getting back to Revelation 12. Now you see here that I have on the screen uh, Babel, much more than a tower, and that's the series that we have been in. And <clears throat> the last few Wednesday nights that I've been here with you teaching, 
We have been in Genesis 10, 11, 12, and we talked about the Tower of Babel, Nimrod, Mystery Babylon the Great, and we talked about how that was uh, forerunners of the coming kingdom of the Antichrist. And I, I have this uh, timeline here that I'm not going to, to, to get into tonight, but I'm going to get right back into Revelation 12, which is the culmination. You know, so much has been said about Bible prophecy, uh, eschatology is called in theology. Uh, but it all comes down to the second coming of Jesus Christ. There is so much said and written and so much in the scripture is given about the second coming of Jesus Christ. There is, there, it, is, it is a vital, it is the vital, I mean, to be able to say the vital doctrine when, when you have so many vital doctrines in Scripture. But the, the second coming of Jesus Christ does not take a back seat doctrinally. Scripture talks about it over and over and over and over. And so much is said about it because it is important. And God wants to, us to look at it. And God wants us to understand it. But God wants us to prepare for it. Prepare in our hearts and to share the gospel with other people. So we're going to look at the second coming of Jesus Christ. And Revelation 12 is just a really concise picture of the last days and the prophecy of the second coming of Jesus Christ. And so many people interpret it different ways, post-millennialism, amillennialism. Is there a rapture? Is there not a rapture? And when does the rapture take place? But we're not going to get into those controversial things. We're simply going to look in the Scripture and talk about the second coming of Jesus Christ. Because every Bible-believing Christian, every evangelical Christian, no matter what they might believe about the details, they all believe and they all prepare for the second coming of Jesus Christ. And we're going to look at that tonight. And it is the culmination of Mystery Babylon the Great, as we say here. And, and we talked about Mystery Babylon the Great, that it started at the Tower of Babel. It works its way up through Revelation 20 and the second coming of Jesus Christ. And uh, Gen uh, Genesis, Revelation chapter 12, last week we talked about the signs and the wonders in heaven. The first wonder was a woman. And it goes back to Genesis 37. And the woman here, let's, let's read it together, Gen uh, Revelation chapter 12. There appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon, and it was under her feet, and her head had a crown of 12 stars. And she was with child, travailing to give birth. And we pointed out that that woman, go back to Genesis 37, verses 9 through 11, was the nation of Israel. It is not the Virgin Mary bringing forth Jesus. It is the woman, is the nation of Israel, and the child she's bringing forth is Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the, the Savior of the world, the coming King, the one day the ruler of the universe, which was, that was her child. Revelation 12, 5 and 6, she delivered her child, and it was the Lord Jesus Christ. Then the second sign, the great wonder in heaven, was the great red dragon. Uh, verse 3, there appeared another wonder in heaven, a great red dragon. He had seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns. And that talks about he, the rule that he will have in the tribulation period. And we're not going to get into the, the minutia, the details of that. But I want to talk to you tonight about this great red dragon that is depicted here in Revelation chapter 12. It is said that the great red dragon hated the child, Jesus Christ, and he wanted to devour the child as soon as it was born. And it goes back to the birth of Jesus Christ, and Herod tried to kill all the babies, two, uh, two years old and under, all the male babies, and Jesus had to flee. His parents took him to Egypt to protect him. That was the first attempt of Satan to destroy God's plan for the ages. So the, the devil revealed, he is called the great red dragon in this prophetic statement in chapter 12 of Revelation. And we are introduced to him, we, he is revealed. Look at verse 9. 
and the great red dragon was cast out. And then it tells us who he is. That old serpent called the devil and Satan which deceived the whole world. Now we don't have to wonder about who he is. God is clear, explicit, specific. Who is he? It is the old serpent, the devil. Who? And if that you don't understand that? It's Satan, the devil. It is it is that entity, that spiritual entity. The, he is a real being and it is Satan. He was created Isaiah chapter 14 as one of God's angels. He was the anointed cherub that covered. He guarded the very throne room of God. And he had pride. He, and he rebelled against God Almighty. But his Satan was created Lucifer, one of God's angels. Again, go back to Isaiah 14. I'm not going to do that tonight. But if you want to read about it, go to Isaiah 14. Lucifer, he was one of God's angels. And he rebelled against God. And we read that in Revelation 12, 3, 4, and 5. You can read it with me or you can listen to me read it. It's, it says, Another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great fiery red dragon, seven heads, ten horns. Again, we talked about that. And then look at the next verse, verse 4. His tail, whose tail? The dragon's tail. And again, this is speaking metaphorically, symbolically. His tail drew a third of the stars of heaven and threw them down to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was ready to give birth. Why? Because he wanted to devour her child, to destroy the Christ child Jesus as soon as he was born. And she bore a male child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. Again, that tells us who Jesus was. A male child to rule all nations with a rod of iron. It is obviously the Lord Jesus Christ. So Satan, he was Lucifer, an angel, and he fell from heaven. And the Bible said, his tail drew a third of the stars of heaven. Now what, what is that talking about? There is a lot of symbolism. There is a lot of metaphors uh, in the Scripture, and especially in the book of Revelation. But we, you and I, we try to take Scripture literally. If one of the rules of, of hermeneutics when I was in seminary, it said, if the plain sense of Scripture makes sense, don't seek any other sense. In other words, take Scripture as literally as you can if it makes sense. And this does make sense. The third part of the stars of heaven. You go back to the stars of heaven. What are the stars? It, and Satan, he drew a third part of these stars down. Let me tell you what it means, and then I'll kind of go back and show you. It, it speaks to the fall of Satan. It speaks to Satan's rebellion against God. When did that occur? In history past. Sometime, we believe, during perhaps the week of creation, when God created the heaven and earth, because we know that Satan had already fallen in the Garden of Eden when he tempted Adam and Eve. So he, he, he rebelled against God. But he was not created as a devil. He was not created as the deceiver. He was not created as the destroyer, which is what he is today. He was created as one of God's angels. And Isaiah tells us his name was Lucifer, the, uh, the, the bright one, the bright and shining one. He was one of the most beautiful crea cre creatures that God ever created. And he rebelled against God. The Old Testament, Isaiah and Ezekiel, if you want to study it, it you can Google that or, or use a search engine. But it tells the story of Satan's rebellion. Satan said, I will ascend my throne above the throne of the Most High God. I want to be like him. Satan was a glorious creature. He was perhaps the, one of the most beautiful of anything God ever created, but he believed his own press clippings. The very first sin of the universe was pride. Pride. I think that is so unusual. You, you find the very first sin of the universe was created not by Adam and Eve, but by Satan. And the very first sin was pride. 
And you know, that is the sin. That is a sin that you and I fight over and over and over again. It, pride opens the door for Satan to come in in so many other ways in our life. Pride. I, and I don't, I, I mean, the, the fact that that was the very first sin ever created makes perfect sense to me. Pride. It is something that I fight, and I expect you fight it regularly in your life. So Satan fell. He said, I want to be like God. And look, here, here's the thing that amazes me. Satan was so beautiful. Satan was so charismatic. Satan was so majestic of a creature that literally one-third of the angels in heaven, when Satan rebelled against God, they went with him. They rebelled with Satan. And that's what this refers to. Satan, he, he, was, he appeared in heaven and his tail drew a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. S Satan convinced one third of the angels in heaven to follow him in rebellion against God. How many were there? There were one third. How many was that? I don't know. What does Scripture tell us? And I, I have uh, I've taught this little lesson down through the years. I've been at Harvest Baptist Church for almost 40 years, and I've taught this little lesson so many times, and, and some of you may have heard it before. Others of you, maybe this is your first time, but this is what my, my supposition is about Satan. It is my educated supposition that Satan drew one-third of the angels in heaven with him when he rebelled. And again, this is in the past. This is during the week of first week of creation, we believe, or we think. But it happened in the past, before Satan tempted Adam and Eve. But he drew one-third of the angels in heaven. They rebelled against God. And they are now what we would call his demon spirits, demon spirits. But here's the amazing thing to me. These angels and Satan rebelled against God and they knew who he was. We've never seen God. We, we believe God by faith. We trust God by faith. We live by faith. Our hope is in faith of the Lord Jesus Christ and God's plan. But the angels and Lucifer, they had actually seen it. They've been to heaven. They've seen the majesty of heaven. They've seen the throne of God. They know who God is. They know what God can do. And still, they rebelled against Him. And, and I, sometimes I think about that and I, my mind just will not comprehend it. And then I consider you and I, human beings. Don't we do some of the same things? How many times do, you, do we, we say we believe Jesus Christ is our Savior. We say that we love the Lord. We say that we are committed to Him. And yet we still sometimes live in rebellion to Him. We still walk away from Him. We do things that we know are wrong. And it is sometimes purposeful and deliberate. And, and so in that sense, when I consider me and humans how we rebel against God, I, I can, I guess, begin to understand a little bit about what Lucifer and those angels went through. But you know what? Satan is the great deceiver. And perhaps he deceived those angels into thinking he really can overcome God. He really can defeat God. I think he knows better. But he is the great deceiver. He deceived them. And if we're not careful, he will deceive us. And he comes to doom and damn us and kill us and destroy us and steal from us. That's what Jesus said in John chapter 10. But he, he drew one-third of the stars in heaven. One-third of all the angels fell with him. How many is that? The Bible says there is an innumerable company of angels. There are so many angels created that God doesn't give us the number. Perhaps we couldn't even comprehend it. But there are a lot of angels. 
and one-third of an innumerable company of angels fell with Satan. And so there are two-thirds of the angels that originally were created that God that still serve God, that still do God's bidding, but one-third followed Satan, and they are the demonic spirits. And, and again, spiritual speculation is just for what it's worth. Of all the innumerable company of angels, of all those millions or billions or trillions or whatever there were of angels that were created, how many of them do we know by name? And the only way we know anything about them is that Scripture gives it to us. But of that innumerable company of angels, and angels are mentioned throughout Scripture. In fact, in the book of Job, angels are called stars, just like they're called stars here. But we are only told that they were angels, except three times. There are three angels that God calls by name in Scripture. Michael, the archangel. Gabriel, who is also the, the, the one who blows the trumpet, or we think he does at the second coming. And then the third angel that we know the name of is Lucifer. And what some have speculated, and it could be true, that those three angels that we know their names, Michael, Lucifer, and Gabriel, are the archangels, a higher order of angel, a higher rank of angels. And perhaps, again, this is just speculation, that one-third of the angels in heaven followed Lucifer. Uh, God ordered, you know, maybe God's system, maybe God's structure. One-third of the angels in heaven were under the command of Michael the archangel, and one-third were Gabriel. That's just the way God ordered and structured and laid out. God's a God of order. And Satan took his one-third that followed him, and he rebelled against God. So we still have Michael, and we still have Lucifer, who served God, and two-thirds of the angels served God. But one-third of the angels fail, and, and Satan drew one-third of them down to the earth. They, they no longer live in heaven, but... They still have access in heaven, and they don't live in hell, although one day they will be cast into hell, not to rule it, but to burn in it. And so the devil is revealed. Who is he? Who is he? He is here. He, he is at the end times, at the tribulation period, at the second coming of Jesus Christ. He is the fiery red dragon who, who just fights and brings the Antichrist kingdom to pass but it is really Satan's kingdom. And he takes one-third of the demons and he fights and wars against God Almighty. Now, we go in... One, we'll cover one more point tonight. We see that the devil is evicted. He's revealed from who he was. He was Lucifer. But he is evicted from heaven, and this is a future tense. He fell in the past. He will be evicted from heaven in the future tense. And let's read those scriptures together. I'll put them up. Uh, Revel Again, we're in Revelation 12, verses 7, uh, 8, 9. The Bible says, And war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought but they did not prevail, nor was a place for them in heaven any longer. Now we'll stop right there. The, Satan, Lucifer, fell and rebelled against God in the past, a few thousand years ago. But this, when war breaks out in heaven and Michael and his angels fight against Lucifer and his angels, that happens, this is a future time. This will happen in the tribulation period. It, there, there was some kind of war or disagreement in heaven uh, in the past, but not like there's going to be in the future at the tribulation period. Satan and his angels, his demons, are going to fight against Michael, one of the other archangels, and his angels, and they fought with the dragon. But they did not prevail. Michael and his angels, because they have the power of God behind them, they 
prevail in this battle. And again, it is in the tribulation period. It is in the future. And so Satan and his angels are cast out of heaven. They are cast out of heaven. That, that, if they're cast out of heaven, that means that they have access to heaven now. And they do. They, Satan and his demons, they don't live in hell. They don't rule over hell. But Satan is the prince and the power of the air. They are they're down here on earth. When Job chapter 1 and Job chapter 2 kind of gives us a glimpse of this part of the story where the Bible says, there came a day, Job 1, when the sons of God presented themselves before the throne of God and Satan also came with them. And God said to Satan, where have you been? And Satan said, I've been walking to and fro on the earth. Peter in the New Testament tells us that Satan is walking to and fro on the earth looking for somebody to devour, somebody to clobber, somebody to mess up, somebody to ruin their life. So you see, Satan and evidently his demons still have access to heaven. They can come and go. For whatever God's reason, he has not banned them from heaven, although he will in the future. He, but they still have access to heaven. Satan, he comes, and what does he do? He accuses the brethren. He accuses the brethren. Uh, we, I'm going to look into that. We see Satan's desperation. Verse 10 of Revelation chapter 12. Satan is the accuser of our brethren. He accused them before our God day and night, and he's been cast down. What does Satan do in heaven? What does he go to heaven for? He goes to the throne of God and he accuses the brethren. And he accuses the brethren day and night. What Satan went to Job. God said, have you considered my servant Job? And Satan accused Job before God. Remember what Satan said about Job? He said, the only reason Job serves you is because you give him stuff. You protect him. You bless him. Satan goes before the throne of God and he accuses the brethren. He accuses you and he accuses me. He causes mischief and havoc in our lives. And he goes there. Satan is real. Satan, one third of the angels in heaven follow him. And he is the prince and the power of the air. And he maneuvers with them. And we see that he, he one day will be defeated. He one day will be defeated. Now, I'm going to stop right there and we'll pick this up uh, next week, Lord willing. And between now and then, you might want to read Revelation chapter 12 and kind of get, get your understanding down. I hope to see you Sunday morning, 9, 10, 30, either right here in person or online. God bless you. I'll see you then.